University of Palermo and uh, a PhD in uh, physical chemistry from the University of Sheffield. And uh, he joined the uh, ICREA, so the Catalan Institution of Research and Advanced Sciences, and the Institute of Bioengineering of uh, Catalonia, the IBEC, so it's very close, uh, in 2019. And uh, he's currently affiliated with the University College uh, London in UK, where he holds an EPSRC established career fellowship until 2022. And the uh, Cherry Molecular Bionics in the Department of Chemistry. Um, so thank you so much, uh, uh, Giuseppe, for, for being here today. I'm really looking forward to, to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And I'm, I'm sorry for causing problem in my introduction. You, you, you don't need to introduce me. I can just go, get on with the science. And you can all call me Beppe, please, which is an easy way to remember. Although, you know, for, for, for those of you, which I bet there are quite a few, speak Catalan, Giuseppe and Giuseppe, they're very close in terms of pronunciation. I, it's a big, big, big pleasure to be here, uh, especially because we're not really a computational group, but we are trying to expand our activity into computational works. So the primary objective here, besides sharing our work with you guys, is to let's catalyze some interaction for the future, et cetera. So I'm, as uh, David uh, has uh, uh, introduced, I'm based in, uh, in, two in two cities right now. My lab is very much spread across London and Barcelona. Uh, I've been in London for now eight, nine years, in the UK for 20. And uh, uh, at the moment I have a lab in the University College London in the Department of Chemistry, I'm also affiliated with the Institute of Physics or Living System. And since 2019, through an ICREA chair, I joined uh, the Institute of Bioengineering of Catalonia in Barcelona. My lab is very uh, diverse, probably to do with my very short attention span. I do apologize for that to my people and colleagues all the time. And, and it effectively can be divided into four major research activities, one which we call molecular engineering, microscopy, physical biology, and nanomedicine. All of them very much balanced across physics, chemistry, and biology. I'm going to give a very quick overview of, of our general activity, starting from the molecular engineering side, and then really focus on two topics, which will be very much different from each other. So perhaps uh, you can, we can make a break in between for questions, or I managed to open the group chat. If you prefer asking me a question while I'm speaking, you can post them on the chat. And then if I think that they are relevant, I will address them right away. Or I, if I don't answer right away, I will um, answer at the very end. So molecular engineering in, in, is very much dominated by the chemistry and the physics. We're very much interested in making soft materials using a bottom-up approach where we start by synthesizing molecules, in particular macromolecules. So we have done a lot of work on the very, very much organic synthesis, either ourselves or in collaboration with several groups. Then the idea is to make those in a way that become much more complex materials, uh, where the, the properties of the macroscopic properties are very much a result of the molecule of organization. And those materials can be applied for service application from biomaterials, tissues, tissue engineering scaffold to biosensor, et cetera. One of the major mesoscopic materials elements that we have uh, dedicated a lot of attention are polymers on these are synthetic vesicles, which are effectively made by block copolymer. In the same way as a lipid vesicle, liposomes, these are, can be designed with different shape and symmetries. And most importantly, we can control also the surface topology of those by creating several level of patterning, etc. Um, the very much reason why we do our materials and the final application, probably 90% of our activity revolve around the idea of delivering drug into the body. So everything is driven by the clinical needs. And as such, we have already spun out two companies, one that is right now trying to develop a brain, a brain cancer in nanomedicine, and another one called SomaServe, which is very much horizontal, kind of works as a platform technology across different areas, serving and helping other pharma companies to develop things. This is based on the fact that we have a two very established platform technology. One we call the intracellular delivery. A few years ago now, in 2007, we demonstrated that we can make soft materials, soft polymersomes, that can be uptaken by cells and then escape in endosomal 
in the summer compartment of the cell, releasing quite a large amount of cargo, that being gene, like DNA and pinRNA, that being proteins, an example there is antibody delivery, or them being drugs which then really enhance a lot to the efficacy of those in, in, in cells. Now, the second platform, which I will spend a little bit more time here to talk at the very end of my at the talk, uh, uh, is a phenotypic targeting. So I'm not going to say much here right now. I'm going to move into what we can do with those platform. We have a lot of activity in immunology, either targeting inflammation or rheumatoid arthritis, vaccine, infection we also have of course activity in cancer oops is it my you guys see my presentation or is it gone yeah it's gone now it's a white screen only i don't understand of course because for some reason java has hijacked in my computer uh, what about now can you see it yes now yes it's back it's good. sorry for some reason java decided to upgrade my 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 browsers and I check the computer anyway, it's back. So what I was saying, uh, in cancer, we are interested in several cancer types, in particular glioma is one, one that is taking a lot of our interest. And indeed that takes me into neurology where we have for many years been interested in understanding how transport into the brain works, in particular the blood brain virus. And as such, we've been able to propose a new therapy for stroke, Alzheimer's, et cetera. Now, very quickly, this is very relevant to the talk of today. One of our favorite tools, besides, of course, applying physics and chemistry and biology, is microscopies. Yeah, we're very obsessed with designing systems and imaging tools to really expedite uh, information acquisition. So in other words, we want to expand into the time dimension. And in optical microscopy, we try to push as much as possible the existing technology, whether that being super resolution or not, or when they are not there yet, we are building our own. And recently in Barcelona, we started building a light sheet microscope to capture dynamics all the way to 10,000 Hertz if we can. We're not there yet, but this is the, the idea. Um, in electron microscopy, which again, I will dedicate a little bit more time later on, we building a, a lot of tools around the new technical liquid phase TM, which I will explain to you later, but also we're very interested in, in applying traditional tra electron microscopy like energy filtering imaging, and of course, computation analysis. This is becoming very important. Both end-to-end -end image analysis as well as machine learning protocols are becoming quite, quite a norm within our uh, workflow group uh, activity. Now, being close to chemistry and having a lot of really talented chemists nearby us, in particular, we've been working with a group in China for many years, we've been given access to very uh, powerful probes that help us into designing these microscopy analyses. And, and, and they can be very specific to specific parts of the cells or can be specific to certain changes like pH or metabolites. And these are very useful uh, to, to our work. Now, finally, the signs of our activity. Being obsessed with delivering drug, of course, our science revolve almost exclusively around biological transport. We're really keen in understanding how that works, both at the using traditional computational fluid dynamics or theoretical fluid dynamics, either to understand how particles diffuse across tissues or how materials is distributed in capillaries, but also more interesting uh, at the single particle level, we're really much keen in understanding how chemical gradients can generate some very interesting photodynamic uh, events that give rise to diffusion osmophoresis. And particularly when it comes to single particle, you might use those to actually drive the particle towards certain chemical gradients, creating chemotaxis and things which are sort of cell propulsion uh, unit. Um, then we also been interested in how materials is taken up by cells, endocytosis. We do a lot of experimental work in that. Every paper hours almost has some intracellular characterization. We sometimes work on theory, very little work there, but definitely we collaborate as much as possible with the computational scientists. In particular, we've done some work with both uh, Angela Sarik at the UCL as well as Ramin Golestanian at, uh, at the Max Planck in Gottingen. Um, and then finally, interesting enough, multivalent interaction. Again, this is an area which I will spend a little bit more time in my talk. And as such, I decided to divide it. And also because really, like I say, my very first intention here is to trigger as much interaction as possible. So I do apologize if I 
packed up too much information in my slide. You can skip them as, uh, as uh, has been told already. This is recorded, so you can always go back to the recording. Or you just drop me an email and ask for my, more information, please. But really, I'd like to discuss in a little bit more detail two areas of our research, which I think it would be very interesting to interact with, uh, with, the, with, with you guys at the Barcelona Supercomputer. So the first part is um, what we call dynamic structure biology. Let me explain you this in a little bit more uh, a, a deep analysis. If we look at biology or anything living really, uh, of course we know this is an hierarchy of uh, organiz an hierarchy organization of molecules from atoms all the way up to cells and then silver organs. And indeed probing this organization is what really made the biology and biological effort, in particular in this range, structural biology is really what dominates. But very often we forget that biology in life is something that has an expired date. So in other words, they exist depending on that time scale we also interested. So it's very important to put biology in a four-dimensional context. And so when we develop, and I am talking about exclusively microscopy tools here to really probe such uh, hierarchical four-dimensional uh, entity, which is life, we do have a lot of tools that really push very well in the in the super resolution spatial super resolution range. I mean, we have a fantastic data with scanning probe microscopy that can go down to atoms, or scanning uh, uh, transmission electron microscopy can really look at single atom or more subatomic or more resolution. And then the super resolution optical microscope now they're really pushing down to single nanometers now, so they're very beautiful. But then the, the time resolution is not there yet. And really, even looking at the ultra-fast transmission electron microscope, we can go about to microseconds, perhaps nanoseconds in some cases. So there is a bit of a limitation there. And I think that is most of a call to arms to really push the development in that direction. Now, in particular in my groups, we are quite interested in electron microscopes. Uh, we, uh, electron microscope is probably one of the oldest super resolution microscope there is out there. It was developed in the 30s by Ernest Rushka, and I, I don't know if you know, it's probably the oldest, the, 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 the Nobel Prize record breaking in terms of uh, how long it takes from discovery to award. He, he was awarded in only 1986, more than 30 years after uh, he was discovered, even though about six Nobel Prizes before the Rushka one were awarded, where no, electron microscopy was mentioned and, and it was very much pivotal for the discovery. But let's not go there. Um, electron microscopy today, has uh, basically opened up a revolution in understanding biological structures and understanding resolution um, of proteins, viruses, uh, uh, protein organization, etc. There are ever every every year or more, every month there is a paper that breaks down now with the latest one down to almost single Armstrong resolution of uh, of proteins and the way we reconstruct things. That is really beautiful in that sense. However because electron microscopy works under very high vacuums, it requires very much non-volatile samples. So we need to either solidify our materials by drying in it or vitrifying it in, in cryogenic condition. And most importantly, you have a really high energy beam to, to, to probe your matter. So that, that creates a lot of damage and artifacts we know there. Now, in the recent years, we have now been able to move away from this idea of looking at life in a frozen state, which is basically what cryo-TM or other TMs do. And then being able to encapsulate those into liquid cells, which allow us to really probe the materials in the, in the natural state. And three years ago, we set up a center in London called the EPSFC Joel Center for, for Liquid Phase Electron Microscopy, and which Lorraine and I have been leading since, and then Chester and Gabriel actually about to finish the PhD, and we got Gabriel starting his PhD this year, and Sylvia is a, 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 a computational physicist that just started uh, last year in, uh, in, in helping us out on, the, on understanding how proteins work. Yeah. Um, we have uh, some very nice microscope in there, and then most interestingly, and most relevantly here for Barcelona community, we managed to raise some money last year uh, and together with uh, Professor Francesca Peiro from the University of Barcelona, the Faculty of Physics, to really develop a similar sort of facility, actually, because we have these three, four years advantages, things are getting cheaper, and then there are new things coming up. So potentially, we're going to have something faster with even more resolution, both in temporal and spatial resolution. 
So it's an exciting opportunity. So we got the funding to install this machine, which will be installed between University of Barcelona and the Beast in the Park Scientific. Now, how does it work? It works by simply encapsulating the liquid into the materials that is electron transparent. And that seems very obvious. And actually so obvious that even Rushka in the 30s, he postulated this possibility, but this has only been possible because of 2D materials like silicon nitride and graphene, which really have this, the right mechanical property to withstand the differential pressure between the vacuum and the liquid state. And most importantly, they are still electron transparent, so they allow imaging across. And so now we can do this for normal TM or STEM, scanning transmission electron microscopy. And, and indeed, we can keep our sample in the liquid state and image it as dynamic as possible. Now, it, it really created a huge streams of fantastic discoveries. The Alvisatos group in, in Berkeley published a series of papers on uh, looking at uh, inorganic materials like platinum crystals and nanocrystal in general. Uh, there are some really nice work from Nikos Omelik and Patterson in, uh, before in Eindhoven and now in uh, UC Rhine on the uh, polymersomes and block of polymer formation, as well as some nice work from the Janeski group on, uh, on uh, looking at my cells, and some beautiful work from Niels de Jong and Francis Ross, which were actually some of the pioneers of these techniques. In our lab now, we have uh, expanded this into material sciences, of course. We, of course, obsessed with polymers, like I already mentioned at the very beginning. We can see them in, uh, in destroying under, for example, uh, redox uh, oxidation states. We can look at them in 3D. We can look at material like mesoporous silica. This is a work in collaboration with Samuel Sanchez and the And in biology, is of course really giving us this extra dimension. We can stick whole cells in there, although this work is kind of limited. And to be honest, super resolution optimal microscopy probably do a better job than what we do. But what really makes a big difference is in proteins and viruses. Recently, we've been such a collaboration with Francesco Stellacci from the EPFL where we uh, were able to look at his ability of destroying viruses using particle and nanoparticles. So this is a single herpes virus that is being treated with the gold nanoparticle. And as you can see from the, 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 the sequences, the viruses start to destroy and disassemble and breaking down. Similarly, with the Xavi Salvatella, the IRB in Barcelona, we, uh, we were interested in, uh, in protein liquidity perseveration and really looking how these nucleates and those uh, droplet form at the nanoscale resolution of few nanometers, that is very exciting. But what really emerged as soon as we start playing with liquid TM is that if I have a, an object in a liquid state under an electron beam and we can image it as fast as possible, and I'm showing here the imaging of a, a block of polymer disc like mine, so something which is anisotropic, something that is like a, a little pancake if you like, you start to see that this object that will, of course, undergo brownian dynamics and rotate all the time. Effectively, this allows, in by capturing a video of that movement, to assess a lot of the profiles of the object in question. And indeed, by using some very simple computation analysis, we can transform this profile uh, library into an actual 3D dimension analysis, effectively looking at our object in really, in a very, a very quick ways, assessing the, the full 3D dimensional structure of our system with a resolution which is almost close to some nanometers, which is very exciting. Of course, these, of course, allow you to really mix up things with the computational work. For example, here, the block, block, block of polymers that we're studying, it was also, of course, grain simulated. And so we use that um, space to really limit our uh, our uh, computational work and so really matching the two together. But really what this has a huge impact is in proteins. For example, if we image a very, very much famous protein for TM analysis, which is called ferritin, a ferritin is like a, a core structure. Let me run this simulation again. This, uh, this uh, reconstruction again is called a core where you have a basically 24 unit all assembled together in such a way. We can image them by cryo TM very well, and we can image it by liquid TM as well with more or less the same contract, which is quite nice. But most important liquid, once you put it under the microscope, you start to see again that dance, if you like, that Brownian dance that every object is subjecting to water. And again, that means that effectively we have access to a lot of profile of the proteins. Now, if we combine these 
we not just say Brownian tomography like I showed you before with particle analysis, we created then a very, very, very quickly with videos, a very fast um, libraries of profiles that we can put them into our algorithm for doing particle analysis and therefore transform that video again into a 4D reconstruction of our product. That was really exciting because we got some really nice match to the original phase, but then we start to assert some really weird differences. First of all, even though we match about 70% the X-ray uh, ground truth, mind you, one of the best TM, probably the latest data better than this uh, from Russo Group in Cambridge, for example, they had the correlation about 77%, not far off from what we, we got. However, when you look at the cryo TM, you start to see really, of course, you can work out the helices very well. In our system, mm, not so much. So we start to wonder, and of course, one thing that our system brings into it is time. So our video can be break down into single quanta or periods, and effectively we can assess the protein as a function of time. So that is something that, of course, cryo TM cannot do. And we can do, and we can focus on the single object if we want to by doing Brian Tanatore. But the result was still the same. We couldn't really see the structure. And of course, to, to, do, to understand that, we went in, in collaboration with Francesco Gervasio, also from UCL, and now moving to University of Geneva. And, uh, and together with him and then Silvia that uh, Acosta, they, they actually started with uh, Francesco and then moved into our group, we started to run some simulation on ferritin. And what you really create, you assert very quickly, they actually, the protein being subjected to molecular uh, uh, thermal fluctuation and whatnot, it will move by the time we do our reconstruction, by the time we do our imaging. So effectively, it's not the same as in cryo and x-ray where the protein is crystallized and fixed. Our protein is actually subjected to a lot of movement, either thermal fluctuation from the whole particle, thermal fluctuation on the single atom level. Now, if we do take into consideration that, that's what we call the snow angel effect. If I want to reconstruct the, 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 this person here, I and this person is moving in that way, of course, if, if I don't have a good capturing of the movement, I will construct a that looks like an angel or some sort of really weird angel with tree or even a butterfly. And, and so all depends on the time resolution, which of course, like I say, we don't really have right now the best, in the best case scenario, we go down into milliseconds, perhaps in, into microseconds. Now, if we know this and use our molecular dynamics analysis on the protein particular, and now we reanalyze the structure by looking how each atom moves within certain time frame. So in the picoseconds, everything is very much within our scores. But go all the way into 400 nanoseconds, we see that part of the proteins actually move less than others. Effectively, we have a way of mapping the rigidity of our structure. And indeed, if we compare this analysis with our uh, TM reconstruction, again, we start to see some very nice correlationship. And actually, the structure that we capture are the structure that are a little bit less read and move, moving during our imaging analysis, effectively, we have a way to really map how the, the protein structure in terms of movement. Now, the ferritin is a bit boring because let's effectively is a ball. There's nothing really going on. A little bit more exciting is to apply this work in a different type of protein. In this particular case, we were, we're collaborating with Finn Werner and Simona Pilota UCL, structural biology department, and they've been interested in their killer RNA polymerases. Is that this polymerase protein has this really nice, there are a few parts of the protein which are really flexible, like the stalk here or this clamp here. And so that really makes a nice opportunity for us. So we put it under our liquid TM, we can see the structure, we can reconstruct more or less using single particle analysis, the final structure, and we have some nice match. But now if we change a bit tactic here, we look at it in the molecular dynamics variation, then indeed we start to see this really beautiful variation here of the stalk and the clamps. And indeed we can map the, the, the protein and mobility across different time scales. And again, if we go up, use this approach then to reconstruct our system. So what we, and here is showing basically in terms of RMSD from the crystal structure, how flexible the system is with the red being six angstrom and, 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 the, zero be, and, and the white being zero angstrom. You, you really start to appreciate that these are really a nice match. And indeed now, 
what we see here is really we capturing the dynamics here. You can see this very nicely in this comparison where, oops, sorry. And let me go back to that just to show you this, uh, where we see basically really the, 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 the movement of the stock is captured by our reconstruction and liquid TM, which otherwise wouldn't be visible. And of course, if you go particle by particle, we start to serve a lot of confirmation. One of them, for example, showing this really stock very sticking out. And this is beautiful and the biology are really exciting about that. So we can see also the clamps opening and closing, etc. And with that, I stop to the dynamic structure biology. And um, please ask any question away, because I want to make very quickly uh, into an, a different art topic, slightly different, but very relevant as well. And that is to do with multivalence interaction. Now, here, what is the interesting bit and the most important things come from, of course, the therapeutic application of works. If I want to target something, if I want to create a medicine for a specific disease, the way that you do that, and this is most like a dogma in medicinal chemistry, you identify a marker then you screen for the highest affinity ligand or drug, you do your preclinical clinical validation, and then very inevitably, all the time, you start to manage inside effects. And that is the way it works so far. And that is to do with the fact that when we design our ligand, we always look at the single ligand receptors interaction. What I show here is a, a section of a brain with a tumor, in particular, as uh, the expression of these LRP1 proteins in brown here, highly expressed in the tumor. But the fact that, that the rest of the, the tissue is visible shows that LRP1, this protein, is not just expressed by the tumor, but also by the healthy tissues. It is more in the tumor, but there is a lot of LRP1 in other parts. So this high affinity games is actually not very good because what basically ends up, yes, you have more interaction here, but inevitably you end up interacting with the rest. So how do we manage these multivalent systems? Let me go first of all, first back into in times in the history of a, a drug discovery and medicinal chemistry. The father of it was in the, a doubtly Paul Herridge, who won the Nobel Prize in 1908. By the way, that was three years after the Einstein Annus Mirabilis which is basically the years when Einstein started to really postulate the existence of molecules amongst other discoveries. And those, those years were the years that people didn't believe molecules existed, right? That, that is how far back Paul Herrich's work goes. Indeed, even though there were no really clear evidence of molecules yet, ligand receptors interaction were postulated already by him. And he actually came up with this idea of chemical specificity and postulating the sign chain theory popularized by the magic kugel or the magic bullet idea. And the idea of creating a molecule that selectively binds to one is actually very much his, his work. And that worked very well for his drug where he cured syphilis and made a lot of money out of it. However, if we look at this in a more sort of collective fashion, the ligand receptor interaction, which is what we normally use for designing our drug, can be simply uh, approximated as an, a, a, a reversible reaction you have a binding event that forms this complex and the energy of formation of this formula or the energy of binding is basically can be calculated through this uh, equation, right? Now, if I ever have a system that is no longer monovalent by multivalence, not just as a receptor, but also as a ligand, the equation becomes a little bit more complex because now we have a combinatorial association. Depending how long our ligands are linked together. So in other words, the tether between our different ligands or the space within the receptor can be the same. You can have a very restrictive formulation system where you have a basically only one possible bound uh, system at any given time because these are too short to allow the second one to bind or too rigid to allow the second one to bind. That already gives us about nine possible combination between this guy and this guy. Now, this number increases considerably as soon as we make this junction much more flexible. For example, if we have a polymer, that number goes all the way to 14. If we have a very flexible system where basically all the ligands can be bound at the same time, that becomes 33. This is just simply by looking at a multivalence of three binding to a multivalence of three. 
Now, mathematically, and from a thermodynamic point of view, you can use a different approach, either using partition function or the, the binding constant, whatever you prefer. But effectively, the interaction can be broken down into the single monovalent interaction, the subsequent multivalent systems, lambda being a number of bonds, and of course, an extra element, which is come from the entropy uh, as affiliated to the interaction. Because now we don't go anymore from one, from two molecules to one molecule, so we go from these two to the, all these possible configuration. So the configuration entropy at the bound state is considerably higher. And that increases the binding non-linearly with a number of, uh, of systems. What does it mean that? It means that if I plot the, the minus binding energy here as a function of, for example, the number of receptors. Remember those cancer cells I show you were uh, here, up here, they show more receptor than the normal cell. Now, if I use my eye affinity ligands, the monovalent system will have a slightly increase of energy. It will be more, it will generate more energy with the, with the target cell, but it's a very tiny increase. So this is a log scale, mind you. Even though in log scale, this is still not very good. Now, if we make these ligands multivalent, that increase will be considerably higher until we reach the, the three ligands, and then slightly less. But definitely the difference from year in year will be considerable. But as you can see, the energy will be strong independently whether we have one or 100 receptors. In other words, we go always in strong interaction regime, which effectively means if our cell express 100, yes, we got a lot of energy release, but if our cell express one receptor, we still have a lot of energy release, effectively allowing for binding. And that's not good news. Now, things change a little bit. If it on, instead of using high affinity, we go for low affinity systems. In this case, our single ligands, you see, is pretty much useless. Independently whether we have a lot of interaction or not, the energy binding will be always below, I say, water height, the, the hydrogen bond of water as a sort of minimum, if you like. On the other hand, if we have a multivalent combination of those, we can reach and we can combine it in a way that really creates a system that only when a certain amount of receptors start to be expressed, you start to have enough energy for the binding to be sufficiently for allowing activation and, and, and binding and then the four target. And that's really exciting. Now, if you allow me to complicate a little bit the maths and we use it instead of uh, energy, we're using uh, a fractional bound particle theta, which comes from a Langmuir isotherm type of uh, formalism. So in other words, we have a surface expressing number of receptor R, and in the multivalent system expressing L ligands, we can calculate a partition function of the bound state, and then from that, we can calculate the partition and the fractional bound particle theta. That is a little bit more convenient because effectively, if I plot theta as a function of number of receptors, these high affinities interaction, they all go up here as soon as I have one receptors. So effectively, all the theta here will be one, and saturating our surface independently whether they have one receptor or hungry receptor. So our target cell being here in a normal cell is that with the high affinity system, you always bind and target both. And that's, of course, if you want to kill the, your, your cancer cell, that's not good in terms of side effect. Now, if we play that game of multivalability, that be, becomes even more interesting. Low affinity is completely useless, like I say, and normally you will be discarding because no matter how many receptors, you still have no interaction. But if you make this really bad uh, ligand multivalent, now that interaction, which I show you with the threshold of energy, becomes like a, an on-off type of binding. And the, the, the slope of this, the selectivity, that allows sensitivities compared to the, the range of receptors. That is really exciting. This was concept was proposed by Martinez Veracrochea and, 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 and Daniel Frank, Dan Franker in Cambridge in 2011. However, it took a long time to become very much possible because if you look at the paper from Dan, even in the best case scenario, the energy that this is possible are extremely low. I can only achieve this very low concentration with affinity, which are in the order of millimolars, which are basically impossible to work in a biological context. Now, how does it work really? You know, if I look at a ligand and it's a receptor, this interaction is not a standing alone system. It happens into a very crowded environment, which is our body. 
this is for example a reconstruction I done of the the, pl the blood plasma, and and indeed before this interaction needs to happen, this single entity needs to repelling the, the surrounding by creating, if you like, a, a kind of a steric stabilization of our system. And of course, our interaction is in this specific and will create a nice bond here and we can use a Leonard Jones type of potential. I call it Elrich specific potential indicating this is a ligand receptor. But it will also happen alongside it's some sort of mean field potential will dictate whether this protein is actually stable or not in its environment. Indeed, this mean field potential needs to be repulsive in nature, otherwise effectively means that, that the things will aggregate and collapse. So you can use many theories, DLVO, DLVO extender, etc. You have a lot of way of uh, defining a different uh, 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 sorry, repulsive potential as well as the attractive potential. In particular, I'm very interested in sterics effect. I'm going to ignore for now hydrophilic and double layer and charge system and focus on the sterics. The reason is because the sterics can be explained from a biological point of view using glycans. Glycans are sugars in many different forms. Our body can use all of these from glucose, mannose, etc. And the way that these glu gl uh, sugars are used are used to decorate most proteins, not all of them, but, but quite a lot of them, using an N or an S or T bonds. This is called O glycans or N glycans. So either using an aspergine or a serine and tyrosine uh, residues. And what you always see is a really nice complex organization of glycans, in some, in some cases creating very complex tree life structures in glycoproteins. Or in the case of protoglycans, you can have a very, very, very long chain, in some cases even as long as 10 hundred units, where you have a very, very long sugar, which is also charged even more because you have a lot of sulfonation going on in this process. So these guys, whenever they have a specific or not interaction, by, them, by default, being so hydrophilic and very charged, they can create some very uh, uh, steric repulsion. So this is an example of a structure organization. This is actually the SARS-2, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 spike, showing all the glycans expressed in its structure. This is a, a, a protoglycans, a syndicans, which is all highly expressed in endothelial cells, in endothelial glycans, and this is showing how long these glycans can be. Now, from a physics point of view, those sugars effectively create the steric barriers. So if I want to bind through my glycans, in other words, if I, my ligand is smaller than my sugars, for example, in protoglycans is the case, the system has to go through those brushes, so effectively compressing the brushing laterally. However, if I have a case where my ligand is as big as my sugars, for example, in the case of N glycans or glycans, then I have a compression type of, bra of potential. And the beauty of this, this, this physics is already worked out for polymer physics for over 40 years. The Al Alexander and Dejan is where they're, they're sort of the, the father of this type of physics. So we already have a, some, some beautiful formalism we can cannibalize already. And indeed, that means our energy of binding is no longer just a simple interaction between line and receptor, it's actually that plus the steric. What does it mean? So recently, we published in collaboration with a friend and, and, and collaborators in, in Imperial College, Stefan Angeletti Umberti, a paper where we show that if I start to put the energy binding as a function of my either receptor or ligand, it doesn't matter, this is very symmetrical. And again, I use the free energy here as a sort of, uh, in this case, up, uh, the real value, and the theta in blue. I wish, what happens today is that if I look at the binding energy in terms of number of objects or actor, ligands or receptors, this will be proportional to the logarithm of that numbers. But now my sterics will change linearly with my number of receptors and ligands. Effectively means that the high numbers, the sterics will always dominate the binding no matter what. Which means our energy will have a minimum and then it goes up. And also means that our theta will have it will reach a theta. If there is super selectivity here, it will go very steep up here, saturate, and then all of a sudden it will switch off. So our interaction, if sterics is present, will switch off a high number. And that is very important. Now, what can we do with this information? Very quickly, because I know I'm running out of time and you're probably running out of patience. Uh, the mathematics is really important to understand, for example, the physics, how any viruses, and in particular, I'm going to show you the SARS-CoV-2 viruses binding. 
Now, if we take information from the literature, we know the viruses approaches the cell membrane, and we know it interact with the heparin sulfated actually. It's not just the steric here, there is an active interaction between the heparin sulfate and the virus spikes. But also, there are many, many receptors that have been associated, the BASI gene, TMPRC, and there are even more coming up. So what we know is that we can define interaction into two steps. The first one, where the virus interacts with the heparin sulfate chain, which is sticking out quite far away from the cell membranes. And then, of course, we have the interaction which has been studied to death with these receptors. The IAC2, probably the most one. We know about the TMPRS2, which is also associated with the cleavage of these. There are a few more coming, Basigen T and, and European et cetera, have been identified. So let me break down this interaction into bits. At the, at the heparin sulfate level, interaction is, oops, sorry. At, at the heparin sulfate level, the, interac the interaction is quite complex because effectively not all the chain of heparin sulfate will bind with the spikes, only some bits, which I define here as a binding motifs, yeah? And the most importantly, the other chain that don't bind with the virus, it will create inevitably a steric repulsion. So we can build up our mass for the single spike HS uh, chain interaction, like a combination of binding and sterics. Now, to understand the binding, it, actually there is a lot of nice work out there. Uh, beside those I showed you before, the, one of the most interesting one, it was published a few, few weeks ago by the, the ESCO group in San Diego, and where they show that effectively the, the, the spike proteins interact with the heparin with, or heparin sulfate in a very nicely in, in the type of a tissue type of origin dependencies with the lungs and the tonsil being interacted stronger than, for example, the liver or, or the kidney, if you like. They identify some sort of mo for molecular dynamics, some sort of nice binding site, is that in the receptor binding domain of the spikes and show where the heparin, in this particular case, a, a portion of the heparin sulfate binding into it. Now, we build onto this, and, and, and by doing some very simple molecular docking, we're trying to understand how that interaction works. In particular, so we want to understand the topology by breaking down the interaction into either the disaccharide, tetrasaccharide, etc. So effectively like a polymer that goes from one to five, if you like. And again, what we show is this interaction as a single chain to single protein itself becomes also subjected to sterics. And, and indeed, the energy goes up with a number of, uh, of entity, which is kind of the opposite of what you should expect, expecting multivalences. So there is a, a multivalence effect, but then at some point this is lost because the chain has to be stretched in order to, to compress in order to bind. So we can kind of work out some sort of empiric equation to describe this, and indeed we've done that. Then the steric potential here, like I say, we can cannibalize the polymer physics to, to really use the mathematics. What we need to adapt is basically a function of zeta, this eight here, which is the various uh, in dimension in there. And then finally, you combine them together, you get the single HS, so the single chain, single spike interaction. Now, you can do the same analysis in the secondary state. Like I said, here we have many receptors. But now the steric potential here emerges from a completely different nature. Because like I for example, if we look at the uh, RBD region of the uh, spikes, it's got about two or three um, sugars which are more or less involved during the binding. The AC2 receptor itself has got about four sugar in the binding area. So you can actually visualize even the smallest possible binding area, you inevitably have to deal with three glycans that are present. These are tree-like structures, which again, we can work out whatever potential in terms of repulsion they, they, they create when compressed by simply doing some conformation analysis. And again, we've done that. So you put together all this formula into a horrible equation, but really this horrible equation allows you to start to look at the viruses in a collective way. And one of the very first thing emerging from our analysis is that if we look at viruses as a function of uh, protoglycan density, and now it's interesting, these are respiratory viruses, so they go inside from our airways, the upper one, all the way to the lower airways. One thing that distinguish this SARS virus, the COVID-2, compared to the old ones, the MERS or the one, is that 
this infects mostly the upper airways, while the other two, on the other hand, always infect the lower airways, which means the system is, uh, it, it becomes more deadly, and these two are much more deadly, but in terms of effectivity, this guy wins because he only needs basically a nose to get inside and, and replicate. Now, the way we can explain this is very simple, which is basically, basically by doing, uh, 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 looking at our analysis of binding, what emerged is that the SARS-CoV-2, and this has been proven experimentally, has a much stronger binding energy with the, with the heparin sulfate expressed in that, and that means that the, the interaction is very, very, very uh, strong enough to overcome the steric potential. On the other hand, these two guys have a much weaker energy of binding represented in here, so inevitably they cannot bind where the density is so high because the steric is completely dominated. And only below into the lower airways that binding happens. And that is very interesting, at least from a clinical point of view. Most important, we're not there yet. We can use this mathematics to represent our body in terms of these receptor combinations. So effectively, the phenotype of our every single body and understand how COVID or virus infection really works across the body. Now, to really quickly conclude, let me show you another example of how we can use this multivalency game. In particular, we're using, using our nanoparticles, our synthetic vesicle, the polymers that I described at the very beginning. We can design them using many different chemicals. And most important, we have a very nice big brush here that protects us from the, the, the biological environment. Means our ligands here can be attached on the brush. And most importantly, we can tune the way we attach this brush so that basically we either or not subject our ligands to sterics. And so we show that if we now combine our binding with the sterics, what basically happens, we start to create some very nice entropic gains. More importantly, if we combine this ligand with receptors in that way, but most also across different type of receptor, we create multiplexes and, 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 and an interesting surface complementarity game. Effectively, creating a system that targets cells as a function of the phenotypic composition of the cell, whether they have a certain receptor or not. And indeed, this allow us really to create a system that goes towards the cells, express the right combination of receptors, not whether they express their receptors or not, but whether they express the receptors, the type of receptor in the right combination. And that is what we call phenotypic target. Now, this of course, we tested in vivo and in vitro, and we proved it to work very well with the glioma targeting and blob and virus using LFP1 and SW1. Let me show you just the experimental data that this point, each, each of these points is quite a lot of experiment. But indeed what we show here that if we have a two type of ligands, we get this beautiful synergistic binding effect where you can bind those brain endothelial cells subjected to the BBB at a much lower doses than the single one. And indeed this converts into beautiful delivery into the brain. These are in vivo data that we collect from a mouse where with the number of ligands correct one, you have this sort of beautiful non-monotonal distribution. And again, you have an optimal uh, uptake into the brain that means more and more delivering to the brain. And with that, basically, we're now proposing something a little bit more complex, where we really indeed use our computational biophysics to feed our experimental screening perhaps using bioinformatics, and this is an area where we're not really good at, but really using those data out there that give us the phenotypic composition of tissue and cell, et cetera, fitting them in there, creating our experimental validation, refining them in terms of trafficking, transport, et cetera. And most importantly, once we have a lot of data here, the idea is to convert those into a, a closed loop where machine learning uh, analysis and algorithm can help us out to, to kind of fill up the gap between the theory and the experiment, if you like. And with that, I finish. I need to thank an extremely talented team that have been working on. Uh, the data I've been showing to you are were generated by Lorena uh, and Cesare and Gabriele and Gabriel from the microscopy side, and Sylvia, uh, where is she? Uh, uh, Sylvia helped a lot into both the, the electromicroscopy side as well as the, the multivalence interaction with the computer simulation together with Joe, uh, that is the, the PhD is doing working on super, uh, super selectivity theory, as well as Azura uh, and, uh, 
and uh, um, and Laura in the past and many others have done a lot of work in this. And with that, also I need to thank my sponsor, the ERC, the IPSSC, the CREA, the Ministerio de Economia, the Competitividad, the, the Severo Choi, and many others that are contributing into this work. And with that, I stop. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you so much, uh, Giuseppe. Uh, so now the audience, if, uh, if there are some questions, please uh, go ahead. Okay, so maybe I can uh, I can start. Um, so what, one question, uh, Giuseppe, is about the, the, the first part of your presentation about uh, the microscopy part, let's say. Uh, I really find interesting you now this uh, four-dimensional uh, view of biology, and I would like to ask you, uh, like, to comment about the your view on the uh, role of multi-scale modeling in uh, integrating, uh, like, the, the evidence that we that we get from this kind of experiments, but at different scales. So, if it's needed, if if, if this integration is actually needed, or maybe it's like better to focus on one <laughs> one scale at a time. And uh, yes, uh, I think this is an important question and it probably doesn't have a really good answer yet. In a sense, what I'm proposing here is to try to create a new tool to assess this type of information. Uh, now we see that with our existing machines, we can assess a new dimension which wasn't accessible that give us some very important insight. We can only make sense out of it by combining with molecular dynamics and simulation. And indeed that of course means comes with its own bias, et cetera. But indeed the two together comes with a really nice picture of what's happening. But also most important, I hope I can do this, is proposing, especially my colleagues in electron microscopy hardware development, that really we now need to include that factor into, into the system. And indeed they're really creating uh, machines that really can assess matters and biological matters with really fast, uh, really gone down into tempo resolution. The resolution, the, the special resolution, although many obsess about it, is I think we, 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 we don't really care anything less than an action, probably is not interesting. I don't know, maybe I, I don't want to diminish the work of particle physicists, but I mean, in, in, biology, in biology, definitely anything less than an action probably is just the same, right? Um, and so, indeed, it really pushing and encouraging both computation as well as a microscopy technique into really uh, creating a, a system that really can assess that time scale, the time resolution is important. And that means that things changes, right? The protein doesn't look like it's crystal protein when you, when you look at that. That's what I, the message I want to give yeah. to yeah. here. And then uh, another question that I have is on the second part. It's about this uh, combinat receptor combinatoriality that you were mentioning in the context of uh, this multivalency game you were describing. I was wondering how many uh, different receptors can be can be targeted. At least how many uh, did you try? So it becomes like um, a Goldilocks type of principle. Okay. Not too hot, not too cold, right? What we notice is that potentially by including by increasing the number of receptors we gain on selectivity in other words if i want to target a subcellular population the more the better right hmm. however the more even in terms of variety and in different types it increases the sterics and so there is always an upper limit in how many we can do now in term, because we, we really like experiments too and we want to assess some sort of information that is experimentally accessible Right now, we limit with three or four maximum type of receptor in order to, 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 to target the one, one cells. For one reason, they are, it's easier to make four ligands. Mm -hmm. and, and then most of the time, actually, you find out that some of the receptor of interest are already there in terms of ligand design. So people already done the work for us. So what we need to do is taking the peptide sequence or a small molecule that is already out there and remodify. And so that's where we go. But potentially, we, we don't really have a and this is one of the theoretical efforts that we are now pushing for, that we haven't really mapped power at the limit in terms of multiplexing how many receptors. But we think is, you know, more than three or four, probably we start to see a lot of sterics that dominate the interaction. I see. Okay. Thank you. 
Sí, Giuseppe, San Francisco. Sorry, I was late for, for the start of your seminar. Just, just following with uh, uh, David's question, I didn't, you know, I didn't quite understand what is the role of the uh, modifications of the proteins themselves. So I understand the, 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 what you explained about the glycosylations on the, on the cell surface side, on, mm -hmm. on the receptor side. But um, the strategy of the of the virus in this case, or the or the binding yeah. protein in any case, in, will be to have more glycosylation sites. No, there, is, there has to be a limit to that. Well, course, what I, yeah, what I tried to do, and I probably I went a little bit too fast on that, and I apologize for that. Is that the glycosylation there as one first rule, first function, which is protecting the proteins from anything by creating a steric shield, if you like, right? And indeed, if you look at the, at the spikes closely, you see so many glycans out there, they really work very, the magic in protecting, and there's some really nice work from the Amaro group in San Diego, they show this, uh, how the, the mobility of those spikes, the, those sugars also affect them. Mm -hmm. And then on this, these sugars are also present in receptors. Many receptors have their own glycosylation, yeah? And what I'm showing here, I'm going with the very close to this interaction, the, 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 the receptors and area that binds to the spikes and vice versa. And if we if you look at it, the area of binding is quite defined there. And then nearby, inevitably for the, 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 the geometry of the structure, you trapped certain numbers of glycans in that area, right? That is inevitable because the interaction is favored in that way. Now, what that doesn't mean that the atto binding interaction is not just about the, the residuals type of uh, positive attraction between the different amino acids, but you need to include, and that's what we do here, a, a component which comes from the fact that by squishing down those, uh, those sugars, effectively you limit their conformation. So you, you have a, inevitably a steric protection coming from these sugars, right? And so this is what I do there we apply the same principle that you, that you, that you, that they, from the cells, which are the glycans, which are really easy to understand, which is a very, very long chain. But this time, by looking at the compression of those glycan chain, it's really shorter chain. And, and, and indeed, you have, a, it's not a strong potential, but if you KT, that changes quite considerably the binding. But most importantly, my principle, the, 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 the things I really want to uh, emphasize here, it doesn't matter the intensity of the single asterisk, but that the way it changes with numbers, again, that number that changes is linear. So at some, when you have so many glycans, at some point you can even switch off the interaction altogether, right? And that's probably why the, the virus in the first place has so many glycans on the spikes, and that's why it protects itself from antibody recognition, et cetera. Did I make sense? It, it it does, but then uh, just 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 for the sake of the argument, yeah. Then the virus will evolve not to have glycans on the binding surface. It's true, or to find a, a binding energy that take that in consideration when you when you define it. Actually, yeah. yeah. It, it's, so it's, it's, it's an equilibrium between the binding exactly. surface exactly. or the something, exactly. the chances of uh, evading the mm -hmm. the. The antibodies and the damage that exactly. the glycans are doing to the binding energy. Absolutely, and, and most but interestingly, it's once it's you once you do that, then your your binding energy becomes lower. Effectively, means that at the lower level of receptor, it will be strongly dependent on the concentration receptor. So you leave cells which have one receptor completely untouched, and once you have a two or three receptors, you start to see this binding, and this will be again nonlinear in that sense. But then on the high number, you, do not inf you don't infect the cells because there are too many and too much sterics, right? For example, this is the case with kidney COVID. Even AC2 is highly expressed in kidney cells, and we do see damage in the kidneys, but it's not so much infectivity being discovered experimentally between the SARS-CoV-2 and kidney cells. But then the experimental, the experimental uh, follow-up of that would be to, to prepare a spike protein with all the glycans and see that the binding affinity is higher. And it's true. And indeed, the very first paper reported for the spikes AC2 interaction where they use a protein express and, and produce it by uh, insect cells, which have a much less complicated glycans. 
they show much higher affinity than those that were done with the human cell, right? Uh, okay, no, I know. That's, that was a question. <laughs> and I know that that is already, I mean, it, it's not done. Unfortunately, the binding, experimentally, the binding energy is it's not really an easy thing to assess, right? And there are many different ways. But definitely, if you compare experiment with experiment, which are very similar in the way they use the, the energy, you show that the, 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 the insect cells, the proteins, were binding much stronger than those which were created from human cells. Yep. I may, may ask something else. Uh, if there are no more questions, that we can. I don't know. So, uh, if someone has a um, question, please. Take I was going to, to, to ask about the. So, what you were saying about the uh, finding the upper number of uh, receptors that can be you know, clustered. And that will be very much related with all these theories about the clustering of receptors uh, for, for chemokines or for other, for other receptors, no? That the, is the, the, the initial binding driving a clustering of the receptors in a given area of the, of the cell surface and there are a number of properties of the cell surface or cell membrane that will favor that is really what triggers the signal in a significant way. No, you know, I, this is a really important question there, Alfonso, because Effectively, what I do now, I did a very simplistic analysis which shows the thermodynamics of my interaction, right? But then as the, the interaction happens, you start to serve all of these changes. So we can cluster the receptor. We can, for example, if I go bound to my cartoons, by simply entering into this domain, the virus itself will push away those glycans because those guys are fluid, right? They attach into membrane. So the sterics will change locally because it will change locally the density. You, you might create some clustering event which change completely the topology of the binding. And uh, now the TMRS2 is the, is the protease that will chew up part of the, of the spike. So there is a lot of dynamic things which we don't know how to assess. The kinetics of the event, we're still not yet there, I think. What I'm showing is a very simplistic thermodynamic model. But what I want to no, this is, yeah. But this is related with key biological question because the other one, one is clustering and the other are all these receptors exactly. that are uh, bivalent, that are uh, homodimers or heterodimers, no? that will be also Absolutely. related with the way they cluster. No? And indeed, uh, what we do right now, for example, when you come to understanding this interaction here in details, when we do our molecular dynamics, we try to really look at the topology of the binding, how many binding sites, how many clustering events, etc. And that changes completely the, 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 the omega that I show you, the, 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 uh, 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 um, the ability the entropy that really creates an emerger from the multivines, it will be depending on this clustering and, and all these things. And then to complicate your life, of course, you have endocytosis. So, you know, the particle is then taken up. So then <laughs> that was the next question I was exactly. going to ask. The next issue I was yeah. going to yes. mention. Yeah, no, no, because, I mean, this is your observation that is like very basic maybe the phenomenon underlying all these other more complicated uh, cellular biology uh, phenomena. No? That's right. So what, one of the things we're doing right now, we are doing both, uh, we're changing theory and then moving away from Langmi Hill and thermodynamics into including kinetics so that we account for lateral diffusion of receptor, et cetera, and, and particularly when those deforms or clusters, right? So if you have endocytosis clustering, but the mathematics is not easy. And, and I think we, we kind of hit a wall of mathematics, which is insoluble right now. Uh, on the other hand, we can, we can expand our Langmi Hill, introducing, for example, a reactive surfaces, some sort of coefficient that say, as soon as this is bound, this disappears, right? Mm -hmm. And that helps a little bit with our analysis. But it, it's where exactly our, our frontiers of theory and computation is right now in, in this interaction, understanding the kinetics and this even more collective effect if we... So simulations may be, may be helpful in this case. Absolutely. If there are no other questions, I... Yes, I, I, I think, think there is one, uh, one additional question from uh, Rock. 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 Yeah. Uh, hi, Giuseppe. Thanks for your talk. I, I have actually a couple of short questions. So one is on the... Um, so there are antibodies that recognize both proteins and glycans, right? So a mixture of the, the epitope can be mixed. Mm -hmm. So so that I think that could be important in, in terms of evolution and glycans and, and so on. So maybe can what are your thoughts on this? 
So uh, you're absolutely right. The steric potential that I defined to you is basically uh, created on the assumption that there is no specific interaction between the sugar and the protein. Yeah? So effectively, the, the, the sugar is there as an inert. Now, when you have the specific interaction, like I tried to show you with the, sorry, the, 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 the other way, when I tried to show you with this, with this idea of um, ligands that is not only positively binding, but also there is repulsion, right? Okay. And that is basically what we're talking about here. So that, that the, the sugars becomes a ligands effectively and interact with the proteins in that way. And so as you correctly say, that you can transform that into an, ep, in a, an antigen and raise an antibody for those sugars, right? You gotta be careful though, because those sugars are common to any cells. Any proteins in our body will express very similar chemistry. So those antibodies can be very dangerous in terms of immune response, and et cetera. So, um, and I think one strategy is where it works is when your sugars are um, from a different species, a different organism. So you have a bacteria or a, a viral, uh, or actually viruses are different because viruses then becomes what the host is, right? But bacteria and, and other pathogens, periodic pathogens like malaria, trypsosomes, et cetera, in those cases, the, your, your sugar's composition are very different from the human one. So the, and then indeed, our body has probably, in many cases, the antibody already recognizing those uh, bacterial pathogenic sugars, right? So if that answers your question. But it, it, even in that case, you still have to account for sterics, right? Because you have the other sugar that the antibody doesn't bind to, they might have to intervene into your equation, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, but but a possibility might be that so sugars are shared, but then if you have an epitope or an antigen that is mixed between the protein and the sugar there, then you have something more unique, right? And something you can target. Absolutely. That's and, true. The, the other level of complexity with sugars is that the glycosylation process is very, very different from cells to cells. And even when the cell is in flame or when the cell is cancerous, et cetera. So the, the glycobiology is a very complex discipline. And indeed, what they show is really those glycans are extremely adaptable. And they change considerably from patient to patient, from time to time, from disease to disease, et cetera. Uh, so it, it, it definitely, if you have that type of information, the glycosylation pattern is different, then definitely you can build your antibody according to that. Mm -hmm. And I believe people are trying to do that, especially with cancer, where the glycosylation has become very different from, from the healthy. Uh, thanks. And just a short one uh, from following this line. So I've had some comments from people in LCMS MS doing glycosylation yeah. saying that most of the studies published in, in COVID-19 are, are from like recombinant material, right? Not from exactly the virus itself. That's right. And, and they had concerns saying that, okay, what you may be seeing there may not be the reality. No, it's, it's very true, Rock, and that's exactly what I was saying to Alfonso to answer the question, how the glycans affect the binding. Indeed, the, the very first of, some of the very first papers showing the interaction between the spikes protein and the AC2 receptor were done on these recombinant uh, models of uh, either insect cells or other animal cells, right? And, and indeed, that means the glycosylation are not the same as human. Humans have the most complex glycans. Uh, the sugar from, uh, let me go back to the slides where I have the sugar, here you go, sorry. This is a, a, a human sugars. Um, a, an insect will have uh, not so many, this, this part will be missing on there. We have probably one or two uh, orders of magnitude less complexity compared to the human sugars. Uh, and so that will account in our, more, in our calculation. Indeed, that's what we see. We're doing these molecular dynamics where we're looking at the binding between the two proteins by putting an insect sugar compared to the humans, and then you change completely the interaction. Of course, in a human as well, you have a very complex line with mannose alone, or you have a disfucoic acid, which are charged. So this is also can create some extra complexity in there. So yeah, but, but you, you, when you read papers, experimental paper, make sure that you go into the, the methods and read where the proteins were made. If the protein weren't made into humans, then you have different glycans. So the proteins are different. Okay, thanks. I'll take this into account. Yeah. Thanks. And E. coli, they have no sugars, actually. So if you go into E. coli recombinant systems, they don't even produce sugars. They don't have a glycosylation pattern, right? 
things. Uh, when, when, uh, one question about the, the, the first part, the microscopy part. The, the yeah. First is the curiosity. You may have said, said that, or, but I missed the beginning. Uh, where is the microscopy sitting in Barcelona? I, I, I hope I, I understood because there was a broken line. Are you asking me where the new the, microscope? The microscope, is? The, yeah. the, the new microscope. Where is this going to be sitting? It will be sitting in a part scientific, very likely. So in a, in a. That was a, that was out of curiosity. No, no, absolutely. The, it was quite a I think yeah. about it. My, my scientific question. My scientific question is the following: because the way you explain. Um, the movements, uh, and I mean, all this is yeah. fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Uh, how this, you know, one thing is to have, um, how the normal modes are fitting into that, how the correlations of the, of the movements or different parts can be deduced from this. Because I understand that we see movements, but uh, one thing is to see movement and something else is to see correlations. I, I agree. I think it's exactly our question right now and literally almost changing everything from day to day, depending how we analyze this data correctly. So one, one first important part is the Brownian dynamics, right? So what we need is, is Brownian dynamics. We don't want the protein to be stuck. Actually for us, it works best if the protein is rotating into the environment we're imagining, right? So that basically, let, let me see if I show you this experimentally, that we, we, we can really capture the different I mean, this is a disk like myself, but the same thing apply here, that we can capture different profile of our systems. Uh, if you do what, what is called tomography in an electron microscopy, I don't know if you see my video, effectively what you do, you do this on purpose. You rotate your sample, capturing different orientation you see of your object, and then reconstructing in 9 d So for us, the brain dynamics is important because the more there is, the more from frame to frame, our object will change, so effectively giving us access to a new face, to a new profile, right? So that's important. Now, if that happens too fast, however, then we start to have a problem, and this is why we're limiting to big objects which are in the order of uh, maybe six, seven, eight nanometers. Something smaller than that would be a little bit more challenging. Yeah. For that, we need a completely, a much faster microscope, which hopefully we build at some point, yeah? And the other dynamics is the dynamics within Within the proteins, so how they, they change and and the different helices move, etc. Because that is of course much faster dynamics. It happens in in sort of nanosecond scales, which is a, a, an area where we cannot do. And so what we're doing now now is doing kind of a try and error approach, where we're looking at these using molecular dynamics, which somehow can give us this information. Right. I'm, I'm going to stop here. Sorry. I don't want to present again my, my stuff. But effectively, by using molecular dynamics, you can somehow map those atoms and move more than others, right? Mm -hmm. And then by comparing this analysis with our reconstruction, then that's where it becomes interesting. It's kind of a fitting the two from the two hands, right? And then trying to find out which one matches the best. And effectively means that from the molecular dynamics, we can work out two things. One is what proteins, part of the proteins move more, and two, what is our time resolution in the, at the molecular levels, right, when we do our reconstruction, yeah? Because each frame will be, of course, it up, obtained into a scale, time scale, which is much faster than those, those uh, hundreds of nanoseconds, right? But how is this addressing the correlations of movements? Uh, I'm missing something here. Because if how do we do that? dynamics doesn't, how do we calculate these maps? Are you asking me? No, I'm, I'm thinking that one, no, I understand you, know, you have the yeah. molecular dynamics mo uh, models that would represent different, different yeah. movements in different regions and then you can fit this with the data and, and correlate the two things. Yeah. But uh, I don't know if I'm, 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 I'm just thinking that maybe it's a difference between continuous movements of a given region, a given uh, sure. loop or domain that is exploring a number of possibilities, and a concerted movement uh, between two different, two different positions in different parts of the molecule. How, how the correlation between a domain moving in one direction and the other moving in the other direction, can you distinguish this from the two domains 
What well, we can distinguish is that uh, um, definitely, for example, this is better to see on the RNA polymerases. Here, what we're looking at is a structure which is sort of a globules with two um, parts that we move a lot. These clamps mm -hmm. here and these mm -hmm. stalks here, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if those two movements were completely stochastics, we mm -hmm. completely miss, miss them, right? Because stochastic means they are basically, statistically they can explore all the space. So effectively, mm -hmm. if this stock would be moving everywhere, wherever it can, so it would become up for us as a ball, right? Mm -hmm. On the top. But the fact actually we see this sort of asymmetry in a structure, basically tell us that this stock is moving in one direction, opposite to the other direction, yeah? Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if we do then the molecular dynamics, then we confirm this. And indeed, what happens is that really the stocks has, yeah, has a lot of mobility, but actually is not stochastic. It really moves. In one, it's, it's got some sort of directionality yeah. movement, right? And so this is where our electron microscope can capture this type of movement, which are, they are directional. If the movement, however, is very random, then effectively what well, it turns out is like a, a ball for us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, okay. What that, uh, this was what I was trying to it was yeah. trying to understand. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So, so Again, the same goes movement from a from a concerted movement yeah. in the shape of the. As you, as you of course, the question here, Alfonso here, and that's very complicated question, which we hope we can inter interact with you guys and helping now out in this. Is of course here we knew that because with that molecular dynamics, right, and then and the protein is small enough to really run them for a very long time, yeah, but when we don't we don't have the protein so we don't know what that protein does that's how we can that becomes complicated right mm -hmm. and, and so indeed yeah. uh, what we really want to show is the liquid tm the liquid phase tm is very complementary to cryo tm we still need the ground truth right so we need the cryo tm people to give us the structures but then what we can do we can use that structure with molecular dynamics to then understand how the, the, the proteins move assemble changes with time yeah? Yeah, I would say it's, it's worth uh, waiting for next week because next week is a uh, cast the evaluation of proteins to the prediction and then maybe surprises sort of uh, what can be done. Well, that, that is a, that, the, I'm always, you know, very often I, I, I'm used to Rebecca all the time, right? Because it's, you know, I cannot really wait for the microscopist or the x ray people to give me the structure, right? I think this year is worth waiting for the results of CAS because interesting, they, they, interesting. Be lot, they are going to be a lot of surprises. Oh, th thank you for the anticipation. I'm definitely going to look forward to it. Yeah. Okay, back to you, David. Yes. Um, now, one, one thing about this, like about those requirements of the Brownian motion, do you think that the recent advance in uh, microfluidics can help in this uh, reconstruction? As I was I mean, thinking, like, also the way you know you. Yeah. Uh, effectively, David, uh, these are microfluidic devices. Our our liquid is encapsulated into a few hundred nanometers of thickness, right? Okay. And indeed, that helps in slowing down the brain dynamics. I see. And indeed, uh, you know, if we, we didn't do that, this protein will look like a ball, right? It's just simply rotating too fast for us to, to capture. Uh, what we are trying to do, and hopefully we will get this into the new microscope in Barcelona, is to do stroboscopic analysis, stroboscopic imaging. So instead of uh, imaging with a continuous beam of yeah. electrons, we're going to create beams, uh, packages of beams of uh, nanoseconds of, of microseconds big, right? So effectively illuminating the system in a very, very short time, right? Yeah. And so that creates, that, and t technically that, that should improve considerably our time resolution, right? Now, time resolution for reconstruction like this, if we want to look at a sequential process, well, maybe not, right? But, but for things like these, where we're looking at the overall structures, it's, uh, it's definitely gonna, gonna help a lot. So we're gonna perhaps even capture things like this, right? In a, in a nanosecond sort of scale. That's what we wanna do. Because right now it looks like we are something in between those two. I think we wanna go down there, yeah? Okay, so thank you so much. I, I, I'm afraid that we're running out of time. Sure. And uh, so we can uh, maybe stop here. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Giuseppe, for, for your uh, presentation, for your presence. And, uh, and well, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, da Davide, I assume that Giuseppe and, and uh, me and uh, some people from my group, we stay in this channel because we have in the agenda some discussion with them now.
Okay, I, I don't know this. Uh, so we are using the same link for the... Um, I, I, I guess so. I mean, okay. since... I'm happy it to say no it's whatever one. You can just yeah. stay on this one. Yeah. Okay, okay, perfect. Uh,